Good evening. On October the 24th, there was a total eclipse of the sun. I saw it from on board ship in the China Seas. With me was Christopher Doherty. He took these pictures. There's totality. And there's the end of the eclipse, with the sun just reappearing from behind the moon. Unfortunately, it wasn't seen from here. So let's look now at the latest picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this shows an area of star formation in the Eagle Nebula, Messier 16. And I think you'll agree, that's just about the most dramatic picture sent back so far by Hubble. But the Eagle Nebula is 6,000 light years away. And this evening, I want to come much nearer home. I'm sure that everyone's seen meteors or shooting stars. Now, a shooting star has nothing whatever to do with a real star. It's a piece of cometary debris, usually smaller than a grain of sand. As a comet moves through space, it leaves a dusty trail behind it. And when the Earth plows through one of these trails, we collect a good deal of debris. And if one of these tiny particles dashes into the Earth's upper air, traveling at anything up to 45 miles per second, it sets up so much heat by friction that it catches fire and burns away. And that's all a shooting star is, a tiny particle burning away in the Earth's upper air. And by the time it's come down to 40 miles, it's burnt away completely. Don't confuse it with a meteorite such as that, which is an entirely different kind of thing and comes from the asteroid belt. Now, meteors do tend to travel around the sun in shoals. And each shoal produces meteors that seem to issue from one particular point in the sky known as the radiant. It's an effect of perspective. You'll notice that probably if you've been on a bridge overlooking a motorway, you can see how the parallel lanes appear to meet at a point near the horizon, the radiant of those lanes. And the meteors of a shower appear to radiate from one particular point in the sky. And the radiant position in the constellation gives the name to the meteor shower. I mean, the Perseids come from Perseid. The November Leonids come from the constellation of Leo the Lion. And you can find Leo quite easily by going back to our old friend, Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and using the pointers the wrong way, so to speak, away from the pole star, and you'll come to Leo with the bright star Regulus and the curved arrangement of stars, making up what we call the sickle of Leo. And it's there that we have the radiant of these November meteors. They appear to issue from that particular point in the sky. Now, of course, there are other showers. There are plenty of annual showers each year, but the Leonids are of special interest. And uh, at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back one of our regular visitors, Dr. John Mason, who is, of course, a meteor expert. Welcome back, John. Why are the November Leonids so special? Well, as you say, we do see a few Leonids every year between the 14th and the 20th of November. And the peak is usually reached on about the 17th and 18th. And at this time, we see between 5 and 20 Leonid meteors an hour. But the reason the shower is so special is that it's well known for the periods of exceptional activity that have, with a few exceptions, occurred every 33 years or so. And this is tied in with the returns to perihelion of the parent comet of the Leonid Swarm, Comet Temple Tuttle, which also has a period of just over 33 years. Now, the dust which causes the meteor shower is very closely associated with the comet, extending slightly ahead on behind it. And when the Earth passes through this dense swarm of dust, we see a great meteor shower. And indeed, the Leonids have produced some of the most superb displays seen in the past thousand years. And there is a chance of increased Leonid activity at the present time. Yes, the parent comet is due to return early in 1998, and so we might expect enhanced Leonid activity every November from 1997 to the year 2000. But, of course, the first great Leonid shower was that of November 1799. That was the first one really studied scientifically. It was, and we have a very good descriptive account of it from the explorer Alexander von Humboldt and his French companion Aimé Bonpland. They saw a great display of shooting stars early on November the 12th, 1799, and for four hours before dawn, they saw many thousands of meteors. The shower was also seen by an American government official, Andrew Ellicott. He saw it from onboard ship cruising off the coast of Florida. And it's known that the shower was seen from as far north as Greenland down as far south as the equator. And there was another great shower 33 years later in 1833. And it was really that shower which was studied and marked the birth of what we call modern meteor astronomy. 
Yes, indeed. The Leonid Shower of 1833 must have been a remarkable display. It caused enormous awe and even terror among the very superstitious people of the time. Some of them thought the end of the world was nigh. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and the shower was visible really along the eastern parts of North and South America. And it was from these parts that the first really scientific observations of a meteor shower were made. Primarily by two American professors, Denison Olmsted, seen here, and his colleague Alexander Twining. And they collected together the reports of many, many observers, and in particular, they were the first people to note that the meteors of the swarm radiated from a point within the sickle of the constellation Leo, the sort of backwards question mark that makes up the head of Leo the lion. You can see it to the right of the screen here. And they recorded exactly where the radiant point lay. Well, that shower of 1833 caused immense interest. And around about that time, in the 1830s, there were various astronomers who were busy drawing up lists of meteor showers. And some of those lists turned out to be very important indeed. Yes, indeed. There was a lot of interest into collecting together from the uh, European, Middle Eastern, and Japanese, Chinese, and Korean records of great displays of meteors that occurred in the past. And one uh, person who did this was another American professor, Hubert Anson Newton of Yale College. And he found that there were 13 uh, past records of great Leonid showers, beginning the first in the year 902 AD. And he realized that these occurred at intervals of roughly 33 and a quarter years. And he made the bold prediction that the Leonids would return again in November 1866. And return they did. And uh, early on the morning of November the 14th, 1866, another great Leonid shower was seen. This time, it wasn't North and South America that was favored. It was Europe. And there were observations made from Greenwich. Meteors were noted as particularly abundant from Greenwich soon after 11 o'clock in the evening. And you can see that the peak was reached at about 10 past 1 on the early morning of November the 14th. And at this time, meteors were occurring at a rate of about 120 oh. a minute. Now, many observers plotted the paths of the meteors they saw on star maps. And the aim of this was to accurately fix the position of the shower radiant. You can see one of the maps here. Now, using the accurate position of the radiant obtained and the time of maximum and the orbital period of 33 and a quarter years that Hubert Newson had prepared, three astronomers, quite independently, worked out the orbit of the stream. They were Giovanni Schiaparelli, Urban Leverrier, and our own John Couch Adams. Now, almost immediately, it was realized that the orbit of the Leonid meteors was virtually identical to that of a periodic comet comet Temple Tuttle, which had been seen early in 1866. And you can see the path of the comet here going out to be on the orbit of Uranus. Now, the retrograde or wrong way direction of the comet's orbit uh, is such that the comet dives down close to the Earth's orbit at what we call the descending node. And the Earth passes close to the descending node of the comet's orbit nowadays on about November the 17th, 18th every year. And that is when the Leonid shower occurs. But we don't see a great Leonid shower every year, although we do see a few stragglers. And to understand this, we need to look at how a meteor stream forms. Every time a periodic comet goes around its orbit, it leaves a little bit of dust behind. And over many revolutions, you get a cloud of dust extending slightly ahead of and slightly behind the parent comet, which over many, many revolutions eventually extends to form a complete loop all the way around the orbit of the parent comet. Now, that has not yet happened in the case of the Leonids. The Leonid shower is too young for the dust yet to have gone all the way around the orbit. And with the Leonids, the dust extends only a short distance ahead of and behind the parent comet, and so we only see great Leonid showers when the comet is relatively nearby. And for most of the time, we only see a few Leonids. There were great Leonid showers before the storm of 1866, in 1864 and 65, and enhanced activity continued until 1869. Well, 1799, 1833, 1866, the comet was due back again in 1899, and many people expected another great meteor storm. But... How wrong they were. Unfortunately, the orbit of the meteor swarm is subject to planetary perturbations. 
the gravity of the giant planets, particularly Jupiter and Saturn, swing the orbit of the meteor stream one way and another, moving the descending node of the stream inside and outside the orbit of the Earth, as you can see here, in a fairly irregular manner. Now, in 1799 and 1833, the Earth passed closer than 470,000 kilometres to the comet's orbit, and a great meteor storm was seen in both cases. But before the return of 1899, the planetary perturbations swung the orbit of the comet such that the Earth passed no closer than 2 million kilometres from the comet's orbit in 1899, and no great meteor storm was seen. There were many optimistic predictions in the press, and there was enormous disappointment when no meteor storm was seen. A few Leonids were seen each November between 1899 and 1903. I suppose one of the best displays was on the early morning of November the 15th, 1903, when 170 meteors per hour were seen. But that was very much less than had been expected. Well, things were no better when the comet next, next came back in 1930-32. And I think many people jumped to the conclusion that the shower had passed its best. But how wrong they were. Indeed they were. Just as the planetary perturbations had shifted the comet's orbit further from the Earth prior to 1899, the reverse occurred prior to the next return in 1965. And what happened was that the planetary perturbations once again swung the orbit of the comet close to that of the Earth, and so there was a possibility of enhanced Leonid activity once again. Now, there was a shower seen in November 1961, ahead of the main swarm, and radio astronomers in November 1965 picked up a significant Leonid shower with rates of up to 700 metres per hour. Rates were low on November the 16th. There was a sharp peak on November the 17th, with low rates again on the 18th. Now, few astronomers, apart from the late Harold Ridley, predicted a return, a strong return of the Leonids, in 1966. And I think few people anticipated the tremendous meteor storm that was to be seen on the early morning of November the 17th, 1966. And you can see the meteors here raining down in the early morning sky. Now, the uh, shower was not well seen from Britain because it occurred during daylight hours from Europe and the British Isles. But as you can see here, it was during the hours of darkness from central and western United States. And it was from here that the really great spectacle was observed. For a period of just 25 minutes, centred on 11.55 GMT on the early morning of November the 17th, more than 100,000 Leonids an hour were seen, with a peak of 2,400 Leonids per minute. After that, the shower subsided somewhat, but there was one final uh, kick in activity in 1969, when another significant shower was seen by observers in Canada. You can see here on the morning of November 17, 1969, rates of up to 140 Leonids an hour at about 9 o'clock in the morning. And since that time, a few, if any, Leonids have been seen. But the comet is due back again in February 1998, so we may have something interesting. John, do you think we can get any clues from studying the great Leonid displays of past years? Yes, I think we can. I've gone th back through the historical records and have come up with 58 outstanding showers and meteor storms since the year 902 AD. Now, for the purposes of this study, an outstanding shower means more than 150 yeah. meteors per hour and a meteor storm more than 1,000 meteors per hour. Now, the first thing you notice is if you study the date of maximum of the shower, you find that the date of maximum has changed yes. due to a consequence of precession of the equinoxes, the advancement of the nodes of the Leonid swarm, and of course the change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar in 1582. In the last hundred years before 1000 AD, the peak was occurring on October 12th, 13th. Nowadays, the peak occurs on the 17th, 18th of November. Now, whether or not we get a major Leonid shower when the comet is close by depends on a number of factors. The first thing is it depends on the number of days before or after the comet reaches the descending node. And you can see here the dense swarm passing the orbit of the Earth. The second factor of importance is how close the Earth approaches to the comet's orbit. If the Earth passes quite close to the orbit of the comet, as you can see here, we'll see a major shower. But if the Earth passes too far outside, 
or indeed inside the comet's orbit, then no major shower will be seen. If we plot the number of days before or after the uh, comet reaches the descending node for 56 of the outstanding Leonid showers seen, you can see that they cluster very slightly ahead of the return of the parent comet, but mainly behind the parent comet. Indeed, 33 of the outstanding showers and all 23 meteor storms, shown here in grey, occur between 750 days before the comet returns to the node and 1,750 days afterwards. Another thing of importance is the distribution of dust inside or outside the comet's orbit. Now you can see here that the majority of the outstanding showers and all of the meteor storms, again shown in grey, have occurred with the Earth outside the comet's orbit and that the greatest activity occurs with the Earth less than 1.8 million kilometres, that's 0.008 astronomical units, outside the comet's orbit. Now all of this tells us that the circumstances are very, very good for significant Leonid showers in the coming return in the period from 1996 to 2002. They may well be outstanding showers in 1997 and 2000 and possible meteor storms in 1998 and 1999. Well, the conditions in 1997-2000 are very similar to those of 1865-68. What does that tell us? Well, of course, in 1864 and 65, there were significant showers ahead of the major storm that we've already discussed that was well seen from Greenwich in November 1866 with peak rates of up to 7,000 meteors per hour. And the following year, in 1867, observers in Nassau, the Bahamas, saw rates of 1,500 meteors per hour in strong moonlight. And there was another strong shower in 1868. This tells us that significant activity is quite likely this time. But I wouldn't expect a significant storm of more than, say, 5,000 meteors per hour. Certainly nothing like the storms of 1799 and 1833, because this time the Earth does not approach the comet's orbit as closely as it did in those years. Well, we may have something interesting. But what about the current year, 1995? Can we expect anything spectacular this month, John? Well, there won't be a meteor storm, that's for certain. But we may see a few more Leonids than usual. Last year, observers in California and Japan saw more than expected. And I think we might see between 50 and 100 Leonid meteors per hour on the early morning of November the 18th. You can't expect to see many Leonid meteors until fairly late in the early morning hours because the Leonid radiant doesn't rise until late evening and you have to wait till the radiant's higher in the sky. There's also a waning crescent moon, but that won't be too much of a problem. Well, many people, including us, are going to be on the watch. We may see a shower, we may not, but even if we don't, then each November for the next few years, we've got more chances. John, thank you very much, and let's hope. Don't forget... If you want the latest astronomical information, then ring our Sky at Night information line, 0891 or dial up CFAX, page 615. And at the moment, there's great activity in space. We have ISO, the Infrared Space Observatory. We have the imminent launching of SOHO, the solar satellite. And, of course, we have the Galileo probe, which by our next program will have reached Jupiter. And when I come back next month, Professor Gary Hunt's going to join me to give you the latest news about the troubled Galileo probe to Jupiter. So until then, good night.